Uh, Trump's lawyer, defense counsel Todd, Todd Blanche, was in the middle of his opening statements today when something unusual happened. Todd Blanche, Trump defense counsel, quote, Michael Cohen paying Stormy Daniels or Stephanie Clifford $130,000 in exchange for her agreeing to not publicly spread false, false claims about President Trump is not illegal. I'm going to say that again. Entering into a non-disclosure agreement, prosecutor, objection, judge, sustained. Mr. Blanche, entering into a non-disclosure agreement is perfectly legal. Prosecution, objection. The judge overruled. Mr. Blanche then continues on for a moment, then it happens again pretty much right away. Todd Blanche. When Ms. Daniels threatened to go public with her false claim of a sexual encounter with President Trump back in 2008, that it was, as the people just said, very close to the election, and it was almost an attempt by Ms. Clifford, Ms. Daniels, to extort President Trump, prosecutor, objection. Judge, sustained. Blanche then tries to keep going, but then a moment later... Mr. Blanche, again, entering into an agreement with another individual, you'll hear this agreement was negotiated by lawyers. Prosecutor, objection. And now at this point, Judge Marchand does not even rule on the objection. He doesn't say sustained, doesn't say overruled. He instead calls lawyers from both sides up to the bench. Please approach. The lawyers and the judge then confer, and then the judge rules. Judge, the objection is sustained. So then Mr. Blanche, Trump's lawyer, moves on to another topic. But he makes it just three further pages into the transcript when the whole thing starts all over again. This time, it's over a mention of Michael Cohen, Todd Blanche, Trump's defense counsel. Quote, separately from his obsession with President Trump and his obsession to get President Trump, on multiple occasions, Michael Cohen has testified under oath and lied. Prosecutor, objection. Judge, sustained. Blanche, he walked, he has, he's walked into a courtroom very near here, raised his right hand and swore to tell the truth, and now he will tell you, I expect, that he was lying. Prosecutor, objection. Judge, sustained. And then for a second time, the judge calls up the lawyers for both sides to the bench. To the bench. Counsel, please approach. And a second time, he upholds the objection. Judge Marchand, the objection is sustained. Now, I was in the court when this string of objections happened in the middle of Trump's team's opening statements. Both sides getting repeatedly hauled up before the judge, the reporter, excuse me, the lawyer having to restart what he was saying, try to find his momentum again, pick back up. To me, as a layperson, it seemed dramatic and strange. But I want to ask our lawyers here, how rare is it for objections to be made during opening statements? How rare is it for the judge to interrupt opening statements with multiple directions to the lawyers, including the one making the opening statement, that they got to come up to the bench and talk to the judge? Why were these objections made? What does this tell us about the trial and about the defense that Trump's lawyer is trying to make? Luckily, joining us now is Lisa Rubin, who was at the courthouse today in the overflow room. Lisa, um, I understand that part of your sacrifice today was allowing me to be in the courtroom in a seat that you might otherwise have had your butt in. So it was I owe not you, a and I'm, sacrifice. I am very grateful, and I hereby bequeath back to you your seat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I think. <laughs> well, you actually, in some ways, in the overflow room, might have had a, a slightly better view of this than I did sitting at the back of the courtroom watching it sort of down the aisle. What was happening there and how weird was it? So it was weird, not just because there was one objection, but because of how many there were relative to the brevity of Todd Blanche's opening statement. Let's yeah. start with the fact that Todd Blanche was an experienced prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, but what he's not is an experienced defense lawyer. We learned today from New York Magazine something that confirms something that I suspected, which is that Todd Blanche has tried exactly one trial as defense counsel in the last decade oh, wow. and on a fairly narrow issue. And if you were just in that courtroom, you probably would have expected as much because his flow was interrupted so many times by these frequent objections and the sidebars. Now, that having been said, Rachel, I think a number of the things that he did today were perfectly intentional because while they were objected to and the objections were sustained, he still planted the seeds of doubt in the jurors' minds. And in particular, for example, when he said that Stormy Daniels made Donald Trump, a victim of extortion, that was immediately objected to and sustained because that, among other things, is a legal conclusion. There was no prosecution, for example, of Stormy Daniels for extorting Donald Trump. And he would have known in advance that the judge was not going to allow him to get away with saying that. I think that's probably right. But there are other objections where he definitely knew. And I think the place where he definitely knew was when he talked about what I'll call the diet advice of counsel defense, where he essentially said Trump believed that these 
non-disclosure agreements were totally kosher because he had attorneys negotiating them for him. That's an issue that's already been litigated as part of the party's motions in limine, which are the advanced arguments about which evidence can and can't come in. Todd Blanche knew when he walked in the courtroom this morning that that was not going to be an argument allowed because he was trying to use the attorney-client privilege as a sword and a shield, essentially saying, my client relied on lawyer's advice, but we're not going to tell you what that advice was. Wow. And just like Judge Kaplan did in the Sam Bankman Freed case, in fact, Judge Marchand cited that ruling in making his own, I'm not going to let your client do that. There is no advice of counsel light, and yet that's where Blanche still went. Um, I'm going to give an instruction now that nobody knows is coming, and I know it's going to make everybody move around, but I'd like to talk to Catherine Christian if I could. <laughs> um, she's on the other side of the room, and lots of cameras have to move, I re realize, in order to make this possible. Hi, Catherine. Thank you. Um, you have experience in the New York, New York District Attorney's Office. Um, the, the, what, what Lisa's describing here about um, about Mr. Blanche's relative inexperience doing this kind of lawyering and this kind of a case uh, is one piece of perspective here. Another piece of perspective here is what's normal in a New York DA uh, criminal proceeding like this when these interruptions, these objections happened during the opening uh, statements here from the defense. Uh, how did that strike you? It's not unusual. Andrew and I will probably have a different experience. New York State Court is not as dainty as federal court. <laughs> so it's not shocking. And defense attorneys, some of them pride themselves on stepping on the line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had object when I was a prosecutor because they stepped on the line. And as Lisa said, oh, oopsie, the jury heard what he said. So it's in their head. So this, I can't say it happens all the time, but it's not shocking. I rarely objected as a prosecutor because I didn't want the jury to think that I was trying to hide something from them or I was afraid. Here I would have objected because he was clearly saying things he shouldn't have and the judge already ruled against. But it's not shocking, at least not in the world of 100 Cent Street in New York <laughs> County. And Catherine, <laughs> let me ask you about something Katie Fang said earlier where she said that, you know, in the minds of the jury... Uh, Mr. Blanche might have not done himself favors with all of those um, those statements being objected to today and all those interruptions because the jury might have thought, even if those seeds were planted in their minds by things he wasn't supposed to say that he nevertheless had them here, they at least would think that he was doing something wrong by being essentially sort of mini-sanctioned by the judge in that way and, and interrupted in his flow. No, and the judge instruct the jury about objections and not to take them against the, the, the defense attorney or the prosecutor. I have heard acquitting juries talk about how they liked how that defense attorney really fought for their client. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you could read into, oh, it's sustained, the jury's going to think very bad. I think, as, as Lisa just said, there was a tactic. He knew that these were objectionable things he was saying, and they were objected to, but it already, you can't unring the bell, is what you usually say. It came out to the jury. And prosecutors cannot appeal an acquittal. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.